So, um, this is the theorem which we want to prove today. So, one of the first thing that as you, you asked last time was why does this product converge at all and uh, once we ensure that this converges then there is still one more thing that one needs to uh, show which is that since f, f we know is of order 1 uh, this function should also be of order 1 then their division will be an entire function of order 1 without zeros and therefore it is equal to e to the a z plus b. So, these are two things we need to show that this product converges not only it converges it is actually an entire function of order 1. Now, to show this we will necessarily have to use some properties of these roots z i s this will not be a convergent function for all possible z i s actually. And the property that we use of z i s is actually the fact that f the function we started with whose roots are these z i s is a function of order 1. So, this already says something about the roots why does it say something about the roots the roots are very closely related or let us say number of roots are very closely related to the order of the function. Think of polynomials, a polynomial of degree k has k roots and that is what the number of roots is, is what determines a degree and degree is what determines the asymptotic growth of the function. Right, the more the number of roots are the higher the growth is this seems somewhat counterintuitive at a first glance that you would expect that more roots are there the less will be the growth of the function, but actually eventually more roots allow a higher order of growth. And so, since we know that the order of the growth of the function we can conclude something about the uh, about the roots of course, the number of roots are infinite, but we can say that within a certain region how many roots are there and that count is what we will derive now. So, So, let us say we estimate the number of roots in some disk of radius r okay. and for this uh, we prove the following lemma first that So, let us say it has t roots z 1 to z t inside the, inside the disk. So, I am ruling out the boundaries in fact, I will pick the boundary r. So, that there are no roots there that I can always do. Okay. Then this product of i going from 1 to t r divided by the absolute value of z i that is bounded by 
the order this the right hand side is essentially the order of the function at distance r the the bound on the magnitude of the function and so is bounded by that magnitude proof of lemma is fairly straightforward let's define a function based on f which is the following need to multiply this with r So, this g is simply f multiplied with a certain product. See, the idea is to take away all the zeros of f inside the disk. So, what we are doing here is we are dividing f by the product z minus z i, which takes away all the zeros. But the rest of the multiplier is to ensure that the absolute value of g does not blow up or it stays bounded by absolute value of f around the boundary. And that is clear by the fact that if you look at firstly note that uh, Uh, what should I say? Let's look at the absolute value of g z for when absolute value of z is r. What is the absolute value of g z? And this is equal to uh, this is the only trick I am going to play here. What is r square? When absolute value of z is r, then z z bar is r square. So I'll replace this by z z. Up oh, where are we? Now, I take absolute value z out in common. And now, if you look at the product, absolute value of z is r, which cancels with the r here, and absolute value of z bar minus z i bar is same as absolute value of z minus z i because one is conjugate of the other. So, the absolute value does not change. So, the product is actually 1 and so what we get is this absolute. Okay. And now for g, uh, what we know is g has g is an analytic function on the disk, right? There is no poles, yes, in the disk, inside the disk. Inside the disk, it has to have a finite number of zeros because every zero is isolated for any analytic function. Every zero is isolated. 
that is something we showed long time ago. Therefore, inside a finite disk or any finite region there can be only finitely many zeros. If there are infinitely many zeros then there will be a uh, how? Yeah, but then they will converge. See, isolated means there is a delta, so that delta disk around that point has no zeros. For every zero, there is a delta disk around it which has no zeros. But in this case, if it's the zeros converge to one point, then that point or around that point there are you can never find a delta with only with no zeros in. Well, okay. If it, it doesn't matter whether that point is a zero or not. Just look at that point. Any for a, any delta disk around that point will actually have infinitely many zeros for any delta. Now, if zero is isolated. This cannot happen because if a zero is isolated, then take any point on the plane there is a small enough delta you can find around which there is at most one zero or inside which there is at most one zero right either that point is a zero then there is a small delta so that no there is no other zero if that point is not zero then there is a small delta which so that in that disk there is no zero Not convinced? Okay, okay. Let's look at this. Fine. Let's look at this. Uh, let's go here. Okay. So let's establish the following property. On some domain. Now let's prove the lemma. For any z in D, there is a small delta Do you believe this lemma? F is analytic on domain D. Take any point in the domain. If F z is zero, if z is a zero of F, then by definition of the fact that zeros are isolated, there is a small delta so that delta disk around z has no zero, no other zero. There is only one zero. On the other hand, if F z is not zero, then it is some finite distance away from any zero of f inside the disk right so take the now the question okay no that's that's not the precise argument so if f z is not 0 then you take a small enough disk around f z 
and suppose it does contain a 0 fine. Now around that point which is a 0 there is another delta prime disk which is has no zeros no other zeros right. So or let us ok. So let us see this. So this is the domain this is let us say this is it this is the disk around delta disk around that suppose it has a 0 here this is a 0 then there is a small disk around this which has no other 0 and uh, or let us say if you look join this line from this point to this point then so i'm trying to find say that argue, uh, argue that take the closest zero to z the question is can one precisely define the closest zero to z Then it it has to be zero. Okay, okay. That's that's simple enough. So that's simple enough. Good. So then there has to be you can't. Then there has to be a closest zero to z. And if this was a closest zero, then you take a disk centered here, off radius. So if this is delta prime, then you take a disk off radius, whatever delta min delta prime at here. then it will not uh, or delta prime or whatever some smaller number than this distance. So, it will not contain any 0. Okay. So, with this lemma in place now you can argue that in a finite domain there can be only finitely many because if not then there will be a infinitely if there are infinitely many zeros then if you keep dividing this domain into smaller smaller pieces every piece there will always be one piece which has infinitely many zeros and keep shrinking it if you stay infinite infinite right and that is not going that is going to violate this lemma at some point I am saying compactness I am saying that take a comp this is a compact set of domain so you find a disk is a compact set ok ok. So, then we go back. So, the finitely many 0 so th this works out fine and so that is the was point of this trick that uh, the absolute value of g is same as absolute value of f on the edge of this disk and further g has no zeros. actually that is not very important, but g is analytic on the disk. The reason G is analytic is that all the zeros of the or the poles of G or let us say possible poles of G are also zeros of f. So, they get cancelled out. So, G is analytic and since G is analytic we can invoke uh, the Cauchy's integral formula to conclude that G 0 the absolute value of G 0 is bounded by the maximum value of f z around the circumference right. In fact, this happens at oh sorry maximum value of g z around the circumference.
okay. And this is same as we as we just saw maximum value g z around circumference in absolute value is same as f z around circumference. This is max f z and what is max f z around the circumference? Because f has an order 1. So, at z equals r f grows like e to the order r to the 1 plus epsilon. And what is G 0? G 0 if you look at the definition of G when you plug the 0 in here what do you get? Product of i going from 1 to t r square up there r down here and minus z i. times f 0. So, absolute value of G 0 is therefore, product i going from 1 to t r by absolute value of z i times absolute value of 0. Now, f 0 is some finite number, it is not it is a non 0 number by assumption, some finite value right, whatever it is does not matter. So, we just put this, this together with the bound we just derived on the upper bound on absolute value of g 0. What we get is and that that is what the lemma is. And now you can see that this expression already says that you cannot have too many zeros here because absolute value of z i is always less than r. So, this ratio is always more than 1 and you are taking product of t of them and we know an upper bound on this product. So, you cannot have too many of these anyway. In fact, with this already you can derive suppose we just take <coughs> try to count how many z i is are there with uh, absolute value less than r by 2 l of these z i So, then we get i going to 1 to l r by absolute value of z i. This is surely less than equal to i going from 1 to t r by absolute value of z i and this is e to the order r 1 plus epsilon and what is this? This is greater than equal to 2 to the l. So, is what we get is L is order r to the 1 plus epsilon and L is remember the number of zeros of f of absolute value at most r by 2. Now, r was arbitrary. So, this already gives a bound on the number of roots of f up to a certain 
whatever that certain value you give whatever bound you give you get the number right. So, let us say if we denote by n r the number of zeros f and that is n r is order r to the 1 plus epsilon and this is a very interesting conclusion of the fact that f is an entire function of order 1. Now, using this, but this is still not the full story of course, this is something very useful we will make use of this later on also. One of the very interesting thing we can use this for is to bound sums of roots some expression of roots. So, here is another lemma. for any delta greater than epsilon if you take the sum of 1 over absolute value of z i to the 1 plus delta this sum converges and proof is pretty straightforward. So, I split this sum by or rather group this sum by absolute value of z i's and I do group them and or absolute value between 0 and 1, 1 and 2, 2 and 4, 4 and 8. So, successive powers of 2. Now, this sum if you look at the thing inside absolute this is in the denominator. So, I can replace this by always or upper bound this sum by replacing this by 2 to the k minus 1 or 2 to the k which one gives me an upper bound smaller value of denominator will give me an upper bound. So, we take 2 to the k minus 1 for absolute value of z i. times 1 plus delta right and now this sum becomes easy so this is how many roots are there between 2 to the k minus 1 and 2 to the k well that's we just derive that just use forget about the lower bound how many roots are there up to 2 to the k to the k to the 1 plus epsilon and of course, some constant here. So, let us just take out the constant parts of this. this of course, converges this is a geometric series converging to some quantity whatever it is I 
think it converges to So, and that is a very, very useful property for us and this is what we are going to use to prove the convergence we just saw. So back to the proof of theorem. So, we consider this product. I would like to prove that this converges, this is an entire function, which means for any z this has takes its finite value and let us say for some z which is let us say capital R right, fix a z whose absolute value is capital R and I want to show that this is a finite value at that. So, I split this product as in two parts z i less than equal to 2 r and one is z i greater than 2 r. This part this is a finite product. So, this surely will converge to some finite value right this is all very nicely behaved there are no poles here. So, it will converge some. So, if I show that this converges to some finite value I am done. So, let us just focus on this part. So, absolute value of z i I order this in product of z i then only consider. Now, why is this finite? we just decided right. We just argued that in a disk of radius 2 r there are only finitely many zeros. So, this is finite. So, that is that argument still holds. So, this is bounded and I want to show that this is bounded. Now, because absolute value of z i is more than 2 r here if you look at z over z i the absolute value of this is less than half always for all i. Therefore, I can write this as e to the this part as e to the log 1 minus z over z i plus z over z i. All I have done is taken written this as e to the log. Now, again log has come here, so we have to be careful, but here again because of this property that z over z i only moves in a radius of half and it moves around 1. So, 1 minus z over z i its minimum value is half maximum value is in the real line 3 by 2 and similarly in the complex plane. So, it is a disk centered around 1 of radius half that is a that is a range here. So, their log is completely analytic on that disk because it 0 is far away. So, I can take any uh, and I can take any log of the infinitely many we just choose the principal log which has no addition to this term. Okay. So, I can write this not only that because again this is at most absolute value in half. So, I can replace this because it is analytic. So, I replace this by the power series in that small disk what is the power series like so let's just bring z over z i first log of 1 minus x what is the power series there is a negative for with all the terms then 
j greater than equal to 1 and then you get z by z i to the power j upon j. So, z by z i minus sigma j greater than equal to 1 z to the j upon j z i to the j. Now, the first term of this is 0 over z i and this one, which cancels with this and that was the whole you know, reason of sticking e to the z over z i there. So, what is left out after the cancellation is e to the minus j greater than equal to 2 z to the j over z i to the j okay. and this is the product. Now, let us take the absolute value of this. So, this product's absolute value or let us say less than equal to e to the well the real part of this real part I can always substitute by the absolute value of the upper uh, the exponent and so I get j greater than equal to 2 z to the j divided by j absolute value of z i to the j. Okay. What? And the absolute values, so it is all gone minus is gone. So, I am saying that absolute value of this is e to the real of this. The real of this is at most real of a complex number, real part of a complex number is less than equal to absolute value of the complex number. And the absolute value of this, whenever as soon as you take that, the minus signs go away. And then you take it inside, so it is sum of absolute values, just take less than equal to. Now, let us take out the first term and inside this we have and let us forget about this j sitting in the denominator, this is only reducing the exponent. So, forget about the j. So, we just take this as So, this again becomes a geometric series and in this geometric series z absolute value of z over absolute value of z i is at most half. So, it converges right and remember that z i this always converges to at most what 2 no matter what z i am choosing here right. So, I can write this as e to the 2 z square by z i square and this of course, now I can write as And this sum we just showed the previous lemma 
is bounded sum over i 1 over absolute z i square. In fact, we can do slightly better here in fact, let, so let me take this out and uh, do the slightly better analysis which we will use later on. See z over z i is always less than 1 in this sum that is by choice. So, z over z i squared is less than equal to z over z i to the power 1 plus epsilon or 1 plus delta. So, this is I can write this as less than equal to e to the sum over z i greater than 2 r 2 z to the 1 plus delta by z i to the 1 plus delta. And what we conclude is that the absolute value of that product is bounded by e to the order absolute value of z to the 1 plus delta. So, we not only show that the product is bounded we all here we are also showing that the that product is of order 1 it is a function it is an analytic function of order 1 and that completes the proof of the theorem, because uh, all we needed to show was that this product is bounded. And now, oh no it does not complete the proof of the theorem sorry I should take that back. It completes first part of the proof of the theorem that is showing that this function is an analytic function uh, or an entire function of order 1 with precisely the same set of zeros in there. Okay. So, that we have concluded. So, now consider f z divided by this this function is an entire function this function has no zeros also because all the zeros cancel out of f and this. So, it is an entire function without zeros if we can get that the order of this function is 1 we have proved the theorem. We know that the order of f is 1. So, if we can prove that order of 1 over this product is 1 then we are done. Okay. So, now we will show that 1 over absolute value of this is at most e to the order z 1 plus some epsilon prime. Now, and we do this using the same thing as we just did actually just in a little bit of an extension of what we just did. So, 1 over the product i greater than equal to 1 of this we write it as 1 over product uh, absolute value of z i is less than absolute value of z by 2 times 1 over two z
this three product is given any z split the roots in three groups absolute value less than absolute value of z by 2 between z by 2 and 2 z and more than 2 z. This is the only infinite product the other two are finite products. For this infinite product we have just shown that the product is bounded by this which is a function of order 1. So, this we are already done. This is already over. So, what is left is these two finite products. Okay. If we consider this, this is equal to 1 over product z i less than z by 2, 1 minus z over z i, oops, e to the z over z i in absolute value or let us say not consider this is not equal to we just consider this this absolute value is equal to let us take the product Now, this this I can ignore why because the gap between z and z i is substantial it is at least absolute value of z by 2 right. So, uh, no, okay, I do not want to ignore this I am all I am saying is that this is a this is less than equal to product z i less than z by 2. Absolute value of z i is bounded by of course, z by 2. Absolute value of z minus z i is at least absolute value of z by 2. So, I can replace it by z by 2 and here I can I need to bring E guy E up there when I take up this is certainly true. Now of course this cancels each other out. So all that you are left with is E to the sum Z i less than Z by two Z over Z i. to this and how do we handle this we cannot handle the sum right can we handle this sum no we need a cheap trick to it we cannot sum 1 over z i we do not know if that is bounded but remember this is a finite sum not only is this finite sum it is only up to z i is less than z by 2. So, this is at most so that means z is more than z i always in this sum. So, I do the reverse of what I did earlier and replace this by z to the 1 plus delta or z i to the 1 plus delta that is always true I am increasing the exponent. So, this becomes higher and now we can bound this. Okay, so that is it for today.